Hey, everybody, welcome back to the Podcast Daily and happy Big Ten Media Days to all of you ready to celebrate like me, Austin Ward, and him, Bill Landis. We'll have Jeremy Birmingham and Doug Maurice with us over in Indianapolis as well. But not today. You're stuck with just the two of us. Hopefully that's good enough. And we thought, Bill, that it might just be a, a low-key Cleveland.com, a place where you once worked, putting together the ballots for the Big Ten poll and the all Big Ten teams, which I do still want to get to. And then college football decided, you know what? Let's get nuts. <laughs> yeah, we're. Uh, it's always funny to me how quickly that switch flips to or from be, there being absolutely nothing to talk about to all of a sudden, like all the crap gets dumped on everyone. Like the day before media days or like the week after some other conference media days, camp starts next week. Uh, camp might start actually this week for some teams. We're playing in week zero. Um, yeah. It's, well, one uh, of those teams does start on Wednesday and they, uh, their strength coach resigned the day before hmm. camp. That team is also on Ohio State schedule. Maybe we'll get to that too. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's fun and entertaining as long as it does not apply to the team that you cover. <laughs> if it applies to the team that you cover, it sucks. So uh, I'm glad and like knock on wood that uh, we're just going to be talking about other programs here. Yeah. Um, my sympathy goes out to people covering a team in Ann Arbor who lost their Tuesday night festivities in Indianapolis if they were going over early, which I assume most of them were to get some Ohio State insight the same way that we will stick around now for the main event of Thursday, which is going to be Jim Harbaugh um, probably not taking any blame for his four-game suspensions or a reported four-game suspension that Michigan and the NCAA have negotiated for him. And boy, what a brutal schedule to start to be missing your head coach. Uh, but <laughs> Jim Harbaugh... Um, lied to the NCAA. That's news. Or the NCAA believes he lied. Jim Harbaugh refused to sign any sort of documentation that's confirmed he lied. Uh, I'm old enough, Bill. I think you are too, to remember when lying to the NCAA got you fired. Now you get to negotiate your own suspension where you miss East Carolina, UNLV, Bowling Green, and Rutgers. Yeah, it's a joke. Um, and listen, like I'm not... Uh, the NCAA uh, is an entirely toothless organization. I'm not here to uh, necessarily cast disparagement on Jim Harbaugh for not cooperating with the NCAA because I wouldn't cooperate with the NCAA <laughs> if I were in his position. I don't think anyone ever should because he didn't. And lying to the NCAA is supposed to be a level one offense, and this is the punishment that he's getting for it. So that should tell you all you need to know about whether or not you should cooperate with the NCAA. But I do find it interesting, like, I'm a little amazed that Michigan has gotten to the point that it's gotten over the last couple of years while Jim Harbaugh has openly flirted with the NFL uh, in a, the most obvious way possible and also now like has this on top of it and they're like they're still like they still got better over that span. I don't I don't quite understand that. Um, I don't. I don't know that this has really any sort of impact on Michigan season because, as you said, their non-conference schedule is a joke. The Big Ten game that he's going to miss is the Rutgers game. I would hope that Michigan could win all those games if I were coaching them. So I, I don't. I don't think there's really any issue for them. But it's like another. It's another layer on the Jim Harbaugh tenure that is uh, complicated, and uh, I do uh, find it funny that uh, he has found himself in this position while being among the more holier than thou coaches in college football. I, I did mention a little bit tongue in cheek on whatever Twitter is called now X. I, X. I, what do we call it? I posted, I, I X'd. I don't know. You I it. thought, yeah, I thought it was amusing <laughs> that he put out, you know, the fundraising plea for NIL in the morning where he's still up there talking about being leaders and best and, and how this is the preeminent student athlete school in the country. And how are you supposed to claim a, a position of moral leadership when you are now suspended for outright lying and then refusing to take any credit or blame for doing so credit? I guess if you're advocating for not talking to the NCAA, you do get credit for doing that. So maybe, <laughs> maybe Bill, you give him that, but um, I, I just, he's, he's obviously a fascinating individual. And two years ago, it was a lot easier for me to say, uh, or previously when I covered the Big Ten as a whole, 
how is this worth it for Michigan to let Jim Harbaugh run their program this way, embarrass them in certain ways when there's no return on the field and he's allowed to operate his kingdom however he sees fit? You can't make that claim now. I mean, he's got two Big Ten titles and back-to-back wins in the rivalry, so now you almost have to, if you're Michigan, I guess you throw up your hands and say, well, okay, I mean, this is what we're getting. But at the same time, he intends to leave, gets on a plane to go to take a Vikings job two years ago, comes back, says he's never going to do it again. The next offseason, immediately does it again with the Broncos <laughs> after the NCAA investigation, which I guess these two go hand in hand, is that, well, if they're going to make me say that I'm lying, I'm out of here. I'm done with the NCAA. And then somehow they work through it, and then he, I guess, will begrudgingly accept this. And now Thursday we have to pay closer attention to his non-answers about how we got to this point. Yeah, I just don't. I, I uh, don't want to give him credit. No, I don't necessarily want to give him credit. I think I think it stands as a shining example of why you should not cooperate with the NCAA. Um, but I am mostly like annoyed with really any program in college football. But Michigan does this a lot. Um, Dabo Swinney certainly does it a lot. I'm sure Ohio State has been uh, guilty of it in the past. Although I, I don't know that I can think of many recent examples of it of like presenting yourself as better than the rest of the sport or higher than the rest of the sport, more morally superior. As you said, you're just like everybody else, man. You're just out there trying to win football games and you're going to lie if you have to, to try to do it. So like own it. Don't, don't pretend like you're something you're not. And um, especially over something like, like uh, silly as this, like the, some of the reporting at the time was like, Oh, he like met uh, recruits out and had a cheeseburger. Like, okay, <laughs> worst things have happened, man. Uh, so I, I just like lying about that and then like pretending you didn't lie about it and refu- like refusing to admit it. I'm sure he'll like as, be- as best as he can c- try to dodge it and, and uh, shake off the culpability when we talk to him at Big Ten Media Days or attempt to talk to him at Big Ten Media Days. Um, I just find it all very phony. Um, I just wish like really everyone in college football would sort of like own the, the hypocrisy at, at times because there's a lot of it going on here. Um, but I guess like and like for if you're listening, if you're an Ohio State fan, I think it's probably pretty fun to take a shot at Michigan right now based based on some of this. And that's fine. That's all that's all fair. That that's part of the rivalry. I think you should do that. Have fun with it. But it's not an overly serious matter. Um, and it's not going to impact them because uh, you know, they're playing high school teams to start their season. I think that's what makes it all the more laughable. Like I'm not seriously advocating that Jim Harbaugh should be fired over the cheeseburgers. Uh, <laughs> what a funny sentence. <laughs> Let's just let that stew for a second. He did Should the cheeseburgers. Not, yeah. did, did you do the cheeseburger? <laughs> yes, you did the cheeseburger, Jim. Just say it. I, okay, you don't remember what all the toppings on the cheeseburger were. <laughs> That's fine. You don't remember what the recruits ordered. Okay, did you eat a cheeseburger? Yeah. <laughs> You did. Um, so that's silly. Um, maybe we can get him to laugh about that on Thursday, although I'm very skeptical about it. <laughs> but like, even when you go back to you know the tattoo situation and Jim Trestle, there was probably a way forward for Jim Trestle to remain as the head coach. I think this all worked out in Ohio State's favor in the long run because of my previous advocacy that coaches should not stay longer than seven or eight years at a school. That's an Mm -hmm. entirely separate matter. Don't have to go down that tangent, but if he, it was the lying for him that wound up getting him in much more trouble than the actual situation. I think, you know, you probably could have negotiated based on what Terrell Pryor and the, and the five got, he could have taken a arguably a suspension for this. The NCAA rules suggest six. So I'm not sure how Jim Harbaugh is getting four. that's not uh, really the point either, but I just hope for Michigan's sake and part of this rivalry, like Andrew Ellis has a deep archive of screenshots. I hope there aren't Michigan fans <laughs> who are out for blood 12 years ago and now having to come to terms with their own head coach lying or allegedly lying or misremembering a cheeseburger. I want to, uh, I want to find this cause I saw someone, uh, tweeted out earlier. Oh yeah. Jim Harbaugh on February 7th, 2015. Thought of the day, what a tangled web we, web we weave when first we practice to deceive. Uh, a quote attributed to Sir Walter Scott. Uh, that was about uh, was that about Mike Weber, right? And uh, yeah, Stan Drayton, I believe, at the time. That, that's right. Yeah, that's a deep so, uh, cut right there. Yeah, never, uh, never tweet. I think that's the golden the golden rule. Never or never zeet. Never zeet. <laughs> never zeet. Yeah, there's there's a zeet for everything. Still, that's right. Um, I touched on this earlier. 
I don't know many details about it. I, I got a, a message earlier from someone I, I know and trust who covers Notre Dame talking about the oddity of their strength coach resigning a day before camp. I don't know what happened there. It, it may not have all that much significance. The offseason work is over at this point for Notre Dame, but you know, plugging in both Notre Dame and Michigan with some of this uncertainty heading into camp, heading into media days is just weird. Like it's a late July bomb. Yeah, it is odd. Like that's, I mean, we, we know how important that position is for, for any college program Um, without knowing the particulars, just like on its face. It's very, it's very odd to lose that position this time of year. I think perhaps fairly detrimental because that's, as you, as you said, like the strength and conditioning portion of the season or of the football calendar is like mostly over, um, especially for Notre Dame as they get into camp. But I think that's a position like they still do that stuff throughout the year, but it's also a pretty important position for um, like camaraderie and, and making sure that that the the team is in the right headspace. I think maybe not always um, position position coaches are not always maybe the best people to to do that. Um, or it's nice to have a, a quote unquote like outside voice, like a, away from the the football uh, kind of to to get a team in line that way and to not have, I'm sure they'll appoint somebody to be the coach on an interim basis, but to lose that person at this juncture of the season, I think probably could have a little bit of an impact. And honestly, like that, that to me feels potentially more impactful than like Jim Harbaugh, not being able to coach the first four games against bad teams. Yeah. I, I don't know anything about Notre Dame strength and conditioning program at all. So I, that's a great way to preface the statement, but I do know how Ohio states operates, which is that, Mickey Marotti and the strength staff spend way more time over the course of a year with the players, whether that's in the weight room, whether that's you know out on the field running, any of the drills, mat drills, all of that added up over the course of a year is hugely significant. So that's that's Mickey Marotti is the one who has his finger on the pulse of the roster and what each. Now there may sometimes be disagreements. We talked with Josh Fryer and Cam Martinez last week as well. We wanted to gain or lose ten pounds, and maybe Mickey Marotti doesn't agree in every single case. But at least he knows the thought process for every position, what they're trying to accomplish, and is involved in that. So, taking that part out of the equation, is it something that can be overcome? Of course it is. Is it a a big deal going into camp when there's always these programs doing their ceremonial passing of the torch or a whistle from the strength coach to the head coach when it's their turn to tap in? Yeah, I mean, I think there's probably something to that. Is it going to translate to week four? Probably not, but uh, I don't think it's what Marcus Freeman wanted to be dealing with right now. No more than Jim Harbaugh wanted to have this suspension over his head heading into 2023 either. Yeah, and now I'm wondering, uh, like Marcus Freeman has a, has a position to fill, so who on the Ohio State staff is he going to go after to fill it? <laughs> well, the strength staff at Ohio State was already rated multiple times this offseason, so... <laughs> yeah. He's probably not got the deepest pool of candidates to pick from at this time, um, but you know that he will be involved. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm sure that. Uh, yeah, there'll there'll be like a, a leak, like a report of like Notre Dame is interested in this Ohio State person for the position, even if they're actually not. Yeah, it's Brian Hartline. Brian Hartline, strength coach. I bet he can throw some weight around. Uh, I think so. Um, all right, so. Let's get into it for a couple minutes. Ohio State is not picked to win the Big Ten. I don't think that's a surprise. Fully expected that. I've said that was going to be coming for a long time. I don't, you know, it's a pick them according to the sports books. I don't think you, you can make a case for either one. Michigan's a two-time defending champions. It's probably fair that they are the preseason pick. Um, unless you disagree with me, I think we need to go straight to the defensive player of the year where I do have a problem. I actually... Uh... I didn't look at that, so tell, so tell me what it is. All right. <laughs> Tommy Eichenberg is third in this. Okay, game. I have a problem with it, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and if you are behind a defensive back from Iowa and a linebacker, defensive lineman, I'm not even sure. I don't know how these names emerged. They've got rel- like no buzz as legitimate defensive player of the year candidates. They both finished one to ahead of Tommy Eichenberg. Now, I suspect what happened, Bill, is that Tommy is third and JT Tuimolo I was fourth. And I think the voters in this probably didn't want to put multiple Ohio State players uh, on their ballots. I think they probably split it and wind up costing them because Tommy Eichenberg is, in my mind, unequivocally the leading candidate for defensive player of the year. Yeah, I mean, he would he would be my pick. I honestly like I and I would buy 
if you want to sell me some some JT Tui Molo Al stock, I would I would certainly buy it. But um, I don't think he had the kind of season last year that would really even warrant much consideration for. Like I I, I would think I would go to Tommy right away. Um, but the the voting body for this, which is it's Cleveland.com polling, I think it's like two Big Ten writers from every team. Um, they know the name JT Tui Molo Al, so I'd imagine that vote was split a little bit. Um, the guys they picked like. Cooper DeGean and, and Jerzon, like they're good players. Um, I don't, I don't necessarily. I mean, it's it's quite possible that either one of them could win the award at the end of the year. Um, but I think Tommy is pretty clear cut. But and, uh, part of it, maybe maybe we're close to it. I don't know. I don't know if there was much appreciation for how good Tommy was last year outside of Columbus. Um, he was super productive. Like he should have been a, should have been an All American. Um, should have been like the Big Ten linebacker of the year. I, I, I think. Um, that was that was close, I guess, with him and Jack Campbell. But um, he's just a really good player who like flies under the radar because he's like you know he's he's a soft spoken, if not mute, dude, uh, <laughs> and and people don't know much about him. I think and like he's not going to be at Big Ten Media Days, um, and that's maybe that's maybe something that works to a player's detriment. Like no, I'm not. Whatever Tommy does, what he wants, he doesn't need to go to Big Ten Media Days. It ultimately, doesn't mean anything. But I think when you're trying to get a consideration for stuff like this that actually can help a little bit sometimes if people just know who you are and know your name and see your face and and that way come to value a little more as a player um but i would have picked him um it is weird to see him third i think he's the the best returning linebacker in the big 10 um among the best returning linebackers in the country and and would have my vote for best returning defensive player in the conference when i i wrote last week about some ohio state players that i've heard maybe not enough about over the summer and it, i i changed some of the criteria across all four some was like some of the more guys who you know haven't made an impact yet who who could i threw a mecca in there because i didn't think he was getting as, enough credit next to marvin but i never thought i would have to include tommy eichenberg in that list mm-hmm. and and maybe Maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe what you said is correct. That inside Columbus or around Columbus or in the Ohio State fan base, there's a, a much larger appreciation for how good he was last year than there is nationally. I thought that he would go into this year, he'd be on every All American list. He would be on every. He's still going to be on all the preseason watch lists for, you know, uh, the Butkus Award, Lombardi, all the other defensive awards. He's going to be on that. Uh, and if he's not, then why are we even making watch lists at this <laughs> point? But you know, and I thought that that would carry him to the acclaim he didn't receive last year. Last year's season was so good that he didn't even have to be as productive as he was a year ago to win those awards. He'd get them by default as sort of a career and name recognition uh, you know, ballot. But I don't. maybe that's not the case. Maybe there are still people who don't understand the level of impact he has on the Ohio State defense. Or there are people that are holding the second half against Michigan or the fourth quarter against Georgia continually against Ohio state and maybe Tommy Eichenberg specifically. I, I don't know, but surely it's gotta be one of those two things. Yeah, it, it could be. And, and listen, there are other good linebackers around college football. I don't, I don't want to pretend like Tommy's the only one, like you have Harold Perkins at LSU. You get the guys at, at Clemson are, are really good. Um, Barrett Carter and, Jer- and Jeremiah Trotter jr. Like there's, there's other good linebackers and, and the, but those guys seem to, for whatever reason, get, more shine than Tommy. And I, I don't know what that is. Maybe, I mean, Harold Perkins is like a crazy athletic yeah. explosive dude. So, so maybe like, I, I guess I get that Tommy. I don't know if Tommy like jumps off the screen at you when you're watching him play. I think, I think there's, a, it's a little more of a nuanced experience. I think when you're trying to gain an appreciation for what he does. And we also have the, the context of just how much better he got from year to year, from 2021 to 2022. And, and maybe, People don't take that into consideration either, but that's a big part of why I think he's so good and why I think he's going to be so good next year is because of that jump that he made. I think he's going to make another one. So I get that that's all hard to contextualize if you're not around it every day. Um, I guess my hope would be that if he's slated now in the preseason, I, I think that's fine. That that ultimately doesn't mean much. Uh, I just hope it doesn't happen you know, when it actually matters at the end of the year when awards are, are decided because if he if he has the kind of season that I think he's going to have, then he will deservedly be in that conversation. And I just hope he doesn't kind of get overlooked in the same way he did last year. Offensively, by the way, Marvin Harrison Jr. Uh, was picked first place. So Good pick. Um, <laughs> I don't know how much we need to pay attention to that. Probably <laughs> not at all. I do appreciate Cleveland.com operating that. Uh, all of those ballots, it is 
truly bizarre <laughs> that the Big Ten doesn't organize that amongst everyone who's going to Big Ten Media Days and giving you a full sample size of people that are covering the, te- the team and the league and this beat. They are, to my knowledge, the only league that does not do it. And all you get once you show up are these completely worthless wa- worthless watch lists of five players. Cool. Yeah, yeah, and it's also it's also they make you do five players from each division. So it's like you have to come up with five from the West. So good luck, I guess. Yeah. Sorry. We know all the good players play for <laughs> Ohio State, Michigan, and Penn State. <laughs> but can you name someone who plays for Nebraska for us, please? We got to spread uh, around the love. Tommy Frazier. <laughs> That's right. Scott Frost. <laughs> Scott um, Frost yeah. All right. Well, we are uh, already in Indianapolis, uh, as you can tell. And we are getting ready for Big Ten Media Days. We'll have uh, all the coverage that you can stand uh, on the podcast. The four <laughs> of us will be over there. Maybe even more than you can stand. Who knows? We'll see what happens. Uh, Ohio State does go on Wednesday. Ryan Day, uh, Cade Stover, Marvin Harrison Jr., and JT uh will be there. We'll get uh, as much coverage as we can for you. Uh, stay with us on the podcast daily. Thanks for joining us on this Wednesday. Happy Hump Day. That's Bill. I'm Austin. We'll talk to you later. <laughs>